And it looks like we are live. Hi, everybody at Ultradent. We are excited to be here. It's Wednesday. We finally made it to April. Congratulations, everybody. This is exciting. Let's keep moving forward. Um, it's me, Hartley Logic, and I am here with Dr. Marielle Parazol. Say hello. Hi. Hi, um, Hartley. How are you? I'm doing so good. You know, I feel like my glass is half full. It's no longer getting like, you know, little teaspoons of water taken out every day with a lot of the uncertainty going on. And I'm feeling good. I'm feeling positive. And I know today we're going to talk about the future of dentistry. And I'm so excited because dentistry is definitely going to change. For sure. For sure. Yes. Um, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, sure. So as Hartley said, I'm Marielle Parizeau, I'm a dentist. Uh, I've had a long career that spans four decades. Uh, that includes hospital dentistry, private and group practices uh, as an associate and as an owner as well. Um, I hung my drills at the end of 2012 to totally focus on prevention and education. For five years, I've hosted workshops for pregnant women uh, and expect, expecting a new moms and uh, their uh, newborn children. And uh, I have school programs as well. But the irony of me being here right now, and it's so funny because I feel so alive today, is that I had a, a major ski accident last year. And uh, if I wouldn't have been wearing a helmet, I probably would be somewhere in an institution relearning the alphabet. So I'm really glad I was wearing a helmet and I'm so glad to be here. And in a sense, the irony is the fact that I feel so alive today while dentistry as we've known it until last month is dying. And this is the purpose of this interview today is to talk about the future of dentistry and how we can reinvent it together. Well, first off, we are so glad that you had a helmet on. Um, kind of weird times to come back, but just like you said, you're now alive and dentistry is at a complete stop. So now's the time to plan. So what are we gonna do? What does the future look like? What are your thoughts? What, what's our what if right now? The what if, what if, what if, what if. Um, one thing that has always been very dear to me is the fact that dentists are really physicians of the mouth, but somehow this is not evident. Uh, we've been separate from the rest of the medical profession for more than 100 years, and we're having difficulty connecting with other members of healthcare. So my big what if would be what if today this health crisis is a golden opportunity to create new bridges with our medical colleagues and other colleagues that we don't know of yet where we can create together a future that is more inclusive, that is serving our population better. And that is addressing the needs of health, not fixing disease. So these are my big what ifs right now. What if we can take these five weeks of idle time to start building the future that is not yet born, but we build it together as it emerges? Yeah. We would love it if everybody or anybody who's watching this, either if it's live or later in the day, post your comments below. What does the future of dentistry look like to you? Yeah. And that's, that's a big, I, I think... If we want to be agents of dooms, we say dentistry is dead and there's, it's a dead end for dentistry. But if instead of trying to fix the problem of dentistry as it was, we see in this an opportunity to reinvent ourselves as physicians of the mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, we come together and recreate that, that future. So one doom scenario is um, we're going to have to build new clinics. We don't have the money to build them. Uh, dentistry is going to be so unaffordable that even fewer patients are going to be able to afford it. And this is all part of the possibility of the, of the future. But what if we can come together creatively and counter this doom so that when we emerge, whenever it is at the end of April or at the end of May, that 
we know what to do and we have friends with whom we can call, have conversations and uh, start figuring things out together. Yeah, I know that um, there was a, a CE credit earlier today that I, I went in for a little bit and they were talking about how even our glasses, our PPE for hygienists, um, I'm speaking about currently, but even our PPE, our glasses, they're thinking about doing swimmer goggles so that it's yep. fully locked on. We do not have anything that can penetrate, you know, we, we have splatter, gets on your glasses, you wipe it off the inside. These ones are supposed to be totally on your face. Even yep. PPE is going to change. Yes, yes, yes. And that has to do with what we know now about aerosols. And we all know that dentistry is a champion of aerosols. We yep, do it yeah. with the ultrasonic. We do it. What are we going to do with the cavitrons? Uh, you know, the hand pieces, the air water syringe. I mean, we create a cloud of aerosols all day long. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, we are going to really have to reinvent ourselves. Um, and the problem with aerosols, and we were talking about that a little bit earlier today, is uh, that in a cloud of aerosol, um, there are particles of various sizes. So the bigger particles tend to not travel very far and they land on the surface and we wipe that surface and that's fine. That's what we've do, been doing all along. The problem is, is with the smaller particles, they can travel much farther. And as they stay suspended in the air much longer, they actually dry while they're still airborne. And these are the dangerous ones. These are the ones that remain suspended in the air for a long, long time. This is why the personal protective equipment is going to need to change. We're also going to need to wear over gowns. We're going to have to wear N95 masks. So these are also things I don't have answers or solutions for when we all return to work, when the world reopens. But certainly these are all uh, the nitty gritty realities of what we're going to have to face. And there is also the quality of the air in the operatories. Yeah. What, what I see in the future is I think um, we will be more like physicians practicing a very different type of dentistry where we will and possibly it's going to be all tele-dentistry that that these meeting with patients will be actually scheduled via a computer and the the meeting themselves will happen uh virtually on a computer like, Hello. like what we're doing right now <laughs> and we will talk about various aspects of dentistry and this is where the education component is going to become very important talking about nutrition and remind me to talk more about that later because that's a really important aspect um, and we're also going to see designated centers where the drilling and filling teeth is going to happen i think dentistry as we know it today where patients come into a waiting room and wait there until their name is called they go into an operatory they get numb they get their teeth drilled and filled i don't think this is going to be viable anymore Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that aspect of dentistry is gone. We're going to have to have designated center. My wish would be to see those in connection with hospitals so that we become more integrated with the current and bigger health system. We're going to reconnect by doing so the mouth to the rest of the body. And for me, that is really, really important. And this is going to position us as physicians of the mouth. So we're going to become specialists of the mouth, but in collaboration with phys physicians and other types of doctors. And I say this because teeth have never been separate from the rest of the body. I mean, well, I've practiced for... Well, I've practiced for 40 years and I've never seen a set of teeth walk into my office all by itself. They're always with their human owners, always, always, always. And we have to treat them as such. Um, so phys uh, phys physicians of the mouth are going to be practicing dentistry more like the model of the physicians of the rest of the body with dedicated centers where the surgical approach of dentistry is going to be done. But as this happens, it's also going to increase the cost. So this, these are all real factors that we're going to face into the future. Um, and in order to address that, we need to um, 
start talking about prevention a lot more. So this is where I say that teledentistry and the education, these are all the modalities that we're going to have to bring up to the surface and do a lot more of this so that there is not such a big need for drilling and filling teeth. And let's face it, um, you know, tooth decay is almost totally preventable. We need to go there. We need to talk about that. We need to do this. I agree. And you're talking to a dental hygienist and you know, we are all about preventing patient education, talking about nutrition. We're about whole body health. You know, sometimes we can find things before physicians, you know, um, I remember I was in hygiene school and my grandma came in to be one of my patients. Thank you, Grammy B. And I took her blood pressure and it was skyrocket high. I can't remember wow. what the exact numbers were. But it was skyrocket high. My professor said, you need to drive her to the hospital right now. So they let me leave oh. I took her to the hospital. Like she had no idea she had high blood pressure. And fast forward five years later, um, she's on high blood pressure medications. She's good and she's healthy. But what if she didn't know about that? What if she didn't come into our clinic to get her teeth cleaned? She would have never known this, that she had this underlying yeah. disease. Physician of the mouth. Yep. And it's yeah, the whole body. Yes, indeed. And the, the other thing is, imagine this other scenario where you have a five-year-old child in a chair with tooth decay. So what's happening today is don't worry, Mrs. Jones, schedule an appointment with Angela at the front desk and we'll see Tommy in two weeks and don't worry, it's not going to hurt. And, and this is all good. This has been a good model until now. But what if we can move on to a different model? And I say this because, and it's related to what you just related about your grandmother. It, it has to do with the fact that the imbalance that leads to the breakdown of the hardest tissue of the whole body, tooth enamel, it's more than two and a half times harder than bone. Yeah. That imbalance is not just affecting the mouth it's affecting the whole body. The difference with a five-year-old is that the organs and the other tissues have cellular turnover. This is what enamel doesn't have. So with the cellular turnover, the liver, the pancreas, the heart, the blood vessels, everything are coping with that imbalance. But give it enough time, give it a few decades. By the time that five-year-old turns 30, if nothing changes in his or her diet, it's very likely that this young adult in the prime of his life or her life is going to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, he's going to be obese, he's going to have uh, hypertension, and a whole bunch of other conditions that are going to affect his or her life. And talking about type 2 di diabetes, in this country, in the southeast, where there's a lot of vulnerable populations, people who live in poverty, the um, rate or the prevalence of type 2 diabetes is very hard. And what's happening to them right now, they are dying in throes because of COVID-19. Mm. Diabetes, type 2 diabetes is one of the major comorbidity factor that leads people to die when they catch that virus. So what if as dentists, as physicians of the mouth, as we reinvent ourselves into the future, that when we see tooth decay in a five-year-old, we call one of our colleagues physicians and say, I have little Tommy in the chair right now and I'm really concerned about him. Uh, we're gonna treat his tooth decay, but uh, could you have a look at him and make sure that uh, his pancreas, his liver and everything is fine? And then give Tommy an appointment uh, for a, a number of sessions with his mom, with a nutritionist, so that we stop not just tooth decay, but other chronic, preventable, diet-related diseases. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, and something that we didn't talk about at the beginning of this, Ms. Mariel, is you actually did a whole TED Talk on nutrition and sugar. And um, I'm gonna drop that link later when we're done with this live. So you guys can definitely view that. It was so educational, please watch it. Um, do you wanna touch on some of those points that relate to nutrition and tooth decay? Because I was shocked. Yes, 
yes. Uh, thank you for asking, Hartley. And, and can you imagine, I mean, someone talking about tooth, teeth, an old person like me talking about teeth, and I have more than 14,000 views. I can't believe this. It's amazing. But anyways, um, yes. You know, like people want to know. So this yeah. is the yeah, and, and the, the big deal with uh, what I'm talking about, and thank you for reminding me about this, is the fact that in processed foods and beverages today, there are unacceptable amounts of sugar um, in every food, manufactured foods and uh, beverages. There, are, there is so much sugar, it's terrible. There's sugar in soup, there's sugar in sausages. In most breakfast cereals, uh, sugar figures as the third and often the second ingredient. In granola bars that are promoted as healthy, sugar figures as the first ingredient. So a lot of times we eat something ourselves or give something to our children with the belief that it's a healthy alternative to fresh food when it is not. So there's a lot of propaganda and, and I really use propaganda with purpose uh, because this is beyond marketing. When we talk about marketing, to me, marketing is honest. Is someone promoting a new product like a cell phone that is going to make your life easier and easier to communicate with people? So if that's marketing, that's fine. But propaganda is misleading people to buy into something uh, and, and misleading them into thinking that it's a healthy product. Uh, many of those are fruit juices made from concentrates where they have a health halo to them where it says no sugar added, non-GMO, all from natural fruits and whatnot. But the reality when you think about it, when you squeeze juice out of a fruit, you squeeze the water and the sugar out of the fruit. And half of the sugar in fruits is fructose. So when you drink a glass of fruit juice, especially when it's made of concentrate, you are drinking high fructose juice. And if it's pulp free, you're not getting any fiber. <laughs> you're not getting any fiber. And that's another very important thing because the fibers are important to the Im immune system and the sugar feeds the bad bacteria. So mm -hmm. typically uh, a healthy individual has very few bad bacteria, like the acid producing, acid loving bacteria like Streptococcus mutans. And we have a lot of the good ones. But when we start having too much sugar in our diet, we're feeding the bad bacteria and their numbers grow at the expense of the good bacteria. And when we don't have the fibers, we are starving the bacteria that take care of our immune system. So we are uh, really in a mess right now. And when we see the change in the microbiome of the mouth, that mirrors the microbiome of the gut as well. So everything is connected and we need to start thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and uh, one more thing I want to add before uh, I finish this is uh, there is a, a concept that has been kind of coming around in public health circles right now, and it's called the commercial determinants of health. Okay. And this is huge. This is about commercial interests influencing the policy makers to make decisions in their favor. And they are very powerful. And if, if we can emerge out of this health crisis with tools to counter, to creatively counter those commercial determinants of health, in the end, the population of the earth will be better for it. It's true. Just think about if we could stop tooth decay and you don't have the, as many bacteria, you know, eating away at your enamel and also affecting your gut health, what would that future look like for us? Mm -hmm. so it would look like a healthier future. We yeah. most likely, I'm gonna say, wouldn't all be stuck inside right now because of this pandemic going around, but we would have an opportunity to be healthier. And it's yes. all about education and educating our patients um, and I know everybody educates their patients and everybody does the best they can, but how can we make it better? How can we educate 
more people? How can we make sure people are understanding what we're saying? Because I'll still have friends that ask me questions with their babies, you know, like, hey, like I put my baby to bed, look how cute this picture is. And I'm like, eek, is that <laughs> what apple juice in that bottle? Like, I'm so sorry to, to say this to you, but not a good idea. Could we just change that for water? And they're like, oh, I had no idea. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that is true. And uh, you bring up a very important point. I, I think we are not in this crisis because we know that viruses come and, and there's been previous pandemics before. So we're in the thick of it right now. And it's going to be really tough for the few weeks up to come. But um, the truth is, is our population and populations around the globe are health illiterate. And we need to address that as well. You know, it would be a scandal if uh, we knew, like, if your child or my child would come out of school uh, not knowing how to add or subtract or write his or her name on a piece of paper, that would be unacceptable and it would be scandalous. And yet, for generations now, children have emerged out of elementary schools not knowing enough about health to be and stay healthy. And this has to change as well. I agree. Well, it looks like we have about, we have a couple minutes left. I have to tell you guys about this awesome toothbrush that Mariel told us about. And actually I lied to, I'm not gonna tell you about this. Know that this is my hygienist side coming out with the toothbrush. Could you please just share this for just a minute? Because how it was made, how it was like, how it works is awesome to me and I want some. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you for asking, Hartley. Um, this is my baby. It is called the Opal. O is O-H for oral health. And Pal is like, well, your best friend. And this was invented uh, uh, with uh, a group of high school students in Park City who were part of the CAPS program. And, and uh, Utah for everybody who's watching. I'm sorry? I said, and that's Park City, Utah, for everybody who's watching. Park City, Utah, yes, yes. Um, and their mandate was to create a toothbrush that would make it easy, simple, and not messy to floss and brush in the classroom. We knew that from what the teachers had told us. So here it is, pre-pasted with xylitol, safe to swallow, FDA approved, don't need to rinse or spit. There's a curve in the handle, that has been designed specifically to assist the brushing so that people don't flip the toothbrush when they reach the first bicuspid. Um, the angle of the flosser is such that it makes it really easy to floss the posterior teeth. And it's a little more difficult to floss the front teeth, but all the other flossers are designed the other way around. So anyways, there was a lot of thought put into that by a team of students who were not really thrilled to end up with me as a project because the other projects were places like Skull Candy. So who wants to design a toothbrush when you can work with Skull Candy? But anyways, this team did really, really well in designing this toothbrush. And um, there are numbers on the handle. One, two, three, and four. I don't know if you can see them. And that was designed as um, to assist the teachers in the classroom to guide their students to floss and brush. So the teacher, all she has to do is say, find number one and put your thumb on it. And it puts the flosser in the ideal position to floss the upper teeth. Find number two, floss the lower teeth. Find number three, brush the upper teeth, that curve to go all the way to the center line. And number four, to brush the lower teeth. The flossing is not timed. The brushing is timed and it's done per hydrant. And we have been doing this now for three years with kindergartners. And yes, five-year-old kindergartners can floss with this. When you divide it in quadrants, when you think about it in the mouth of a four-year or five-year-old, there are only five teeth per quadrant. It's simple. And there's space between the teeth. It, and what we discovered, to my surprise, is that it's actually easier to teach a five-year-old to floss than it is to teach an adult who's never flossed to floss. I feel you on that one. <laughs> uh, I love that you have these high schoolers create the future of dentistry. 
you had them create, or you told them about a problem. Hey, how do we make this super easy? And look what they came up with. That's the part of education that I'm talking about. We educate people when they're younger to be more with more nutrition. Here's how you floss. Here's how you brush. You give them this tool. We're going to be focusing on more preventative versus drill and fill. And it's totally feasible. I mean, these two teenagers were so not thrilled to end up with me and they were, their motivation levels were really low. They were not engaged. And by the end of the semester, they were totally engaged. They were oral health advocates and they were so persuasive when they presented to their peers that they were invited uh, to present for the whole school district. Oh and these were two shy teenagers who could not speak publicly at the beginning of the semester. So it was a huge transformation. It was pretty cool to see. That is so cool. Well, it looks like we are about to the end. Is there any last things that you want to mention? Last things, you know, my wish as a tooth fairy would be if there is an interest of people coming together virtually via Zoom into a workshop where we could work together in finding, beginning to find uh, how we're going to build that future that will emerge when we all go back to work. If there's an interest for that, I would definitely be keen in hosting such a workshop and it would be longer than the, the half an hour you've allotted me, but I'm so grateful for what you've given to me, Hartley, this is wonderful. But if there's a desire to go further and deeper into this, into designing the future of dentistry and becoming physicians of the mouth, I would love to address that in a longer workshop. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so you heard it here. If you would like us to do a workshop where we all come together and we game plan what our future looks like, um, let us know in the comments, drop a comment, drop an emoji, just let us know and we can make that happen. We can do it in, on another Facebook Live. We can schedule that out so you can write in questions or you can even join us on a Zoom call just like we're doing now. Um, just let us know and we at Ultradent will definitely make that happen because we're in this together. So let's make a better future for ourselves. Everybody have a great Wednesday and hopefully we'll hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Hartley.